pleasure to be here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just get started. Uh, we have about an hour together. So, uh, what is your name? Uh, Tim. Tim Mark. Nice to meet you. And where are you at school? Western Michigan. Western Michigan. Great. What would you like to play today? Uh, well, I have the Crespo uh, improvisation as a solo, or we can jump right to excerpts. Really what excerpts did you have? Uh, to a mirror and bolero. To a mirror would be great. Yeah. Sure. declaration at the very beginning. Pronounce. Now, before you start, I see there's a lot of, you're kind of getting situated, and I do this a lot too, but if you really can, just bring the one up to your face. There's not really any movement, and then you just right out of the gate. you can even maybe 5% increase it and then keep going this time. sections. One's forte and then we go to piano. And they're two different character characters. And we want we really want a character change when we come in on that fourth bar. So we have something very strong. It's a very uh, you know kind of a dictatorship declarative opening. And then when we change characters we want to get soft and very cantable. So Come in the next one. We want to show our committee or whoever we're playing for that we can have a lot of variance in our playing. <laughs> Show us your character change in style, and then don't crescendo to the A flat, and then do a slight retard. Yeah, and even more sound. Bum bum bum. Beautiful, keep going to ready. 
this call and response, this first section. And then when we come in on this next E flat, it needs to be different than the F. It can't just be the same. Do your best to make this B flat in the next measure be not uh, clipped, be full value. One more time. Yeah. You have a really great sound. Um, Vary up your energy. Have, be able to uh, display different types of energy throughout the excerpt, like we talked at the beginning, and then in the fourth bar, and then as we're going to this next section. Everything is really nice. Your playing is really nice. We just want to hear different sides of you. That's all. <coughs> So we have like a level one. And then level two is just a slight increase in pronounced sound. And then a level three is one more step in that direction. So. Really, so we have some, some the music is going somewhere. And I think your tendency is kind of Everything sounds really great, and your technique and your sound is all very nice, but it's all, um, we, we want to add a little bit more variance to it. So this is this little tier system, as I call it, as a way to do that. I'm going to start on the E flat. Good. When, you, when you start that first tier, you have to really come down. You have to really come down in volume. And when you started this E flat, that was really wonderful. We heard the character change. It's trying to find itself before it begins to resolve again. So, um, to me, it's not a loud sound. It's not a covered sound. Uh, it's not big. It's just it's um, it's it's a curious sound, and that is sort of up to you to kind of decide how to create that. But it needs to be a different character um, than what we ended with before. <laughs> Yeah, let's go all the way back to the mezzo forte here. It's a little fuller sound because we have a couple character changes to make. We want to give ourselves room. Uh, we know there's a long ways to go. So mezzo forte. Yeah, I think even a little bit more because we know that E flat is going to be sort of a response. <clears throat> Thank you. 
before we leave this excerpt, I'd like to do the opening one more time, just because that, compared to the rest of it, is the biggest difference, the biggest <coughs> character change that we offer. And often, this is the first excerpt that we play on an audition. So, to hear someone come out in a very confident manner, to be able to play in tune and in time, but to sustain their sound in a very declaratory way to start this excerpt. I mean, think of how the movement before this ends, and then, boom, here we are, the requiem right away. It's right out of the gate. So, immediacy of sound, and really make a statement. Watching you, you're so relaxed, and that's a great quality. But your breath and everything, it just doesn't set me up to, as I'm watching you, that you're starting to Mirror. It feels like you might be starting the say, song on the organ symphony or something. Just really, you're ready to go here. If you're planted, on the side of saying, you know, Tim, you're making too much of a statement when you start. Can you, can you tone it down a little bit? We're not there yet. So really, really step out of your element. on that breath, but really take up. I really feel like you're taking in 40%, like 80 to 90% of your breath. Just really, really take a great breath. So take your time, take your time. We're gonna, we're doing 50% more now, I think, than when you started. That's our goal. So keep that in mind, and you're making it a declaratory statement here. I just want you to keep going so you can describe it in your mind so when you play it, it's very clear. That's all I got. Okay, that's good. That's a lot. That's good. Okay. So all of those words that you said, I really want you to do that. Okay? All right. Good. a big difference. Everybody heard the difference, right? Yeah. Much better. Yeah. yeah. In the third bar, to set us up now, we've talked about making character changes. Um, the decrescendo on this B-flat is something that we could add. And it's, you know, in the orchestral literature, playing in a section, and we're in the back of the orchestra, a skill to have is to be able to to play a note, to always be able to sustain on a long note without moving, uh, you know, the sound. But then also being able to decrescendo the sound and uh, into nothing and allow the sound to also not move. And so that is definitely um, a skill to, to work on. <laughs> Start Hungarian March because we have two minutes. Uh, Hungarian March or Was Bolero? Uh, Bolero is fine, either one. 
concept as tuba mirror. You fall in this middle category where you have a very nice sound and your technique is good and your rhythm is pretty good and your pitch is pretty good, but then everything sort of just falls in this kind of like, it's this general area that's like, okay, yeah, this guy can play, but there's, you have to, there has to be like a wow factor sort of thing. And that comes in the details. And you have to honor every single detail that's written here, like this accent, for example. And know when to, after that accent, to be able to allow the notes around it to be less so you can accentuate that. Um, making a phrase, also, uh, the, the way we ended this excerpt, I know we're running low on time. It was sort of a mistake to start this, but I wanted to give you extra time. Um, <laughs> should end strong. Um, it should really end full. Um, let me try that once. Here. <laughs> There's a big break there. Da 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 dong. Just a little, just enough break for a breath, but nothing more. <laughs> To the rest of us, it really is like just a two percent crescendo. We want to encourage you fifty percent. Okay, I can do more. Very nice box. It's really well put together, and uh, there's darn any leaks or anything like that. But we need to just expand the, all your horizons in each way so that you say a lot more with each excerpt. You know, at an audition, they put a, a list of maybe five excerpts, and each excerpt you have to you have to really say something completely different, and you have to max out your uh, your delivery and your message with with um, with each excerpt and that's surrounded by the composer's intentions that's surrounded 
by a, a combination of you know your fundamentals, rhythm, pitch, and sound being there all the time, and then there has to be a little bit of of, of you in there as well. So it's those combinations of things that, that creates this package that makes you marketable uh, for um, being successful in an audition. And I'm, I, I went in this direction of talking about this because I'm assuming that's why we're working on the excerpts for audition sec. So excellent job, Tim. Nice to meet you. Good morning. It's still morning. Excellent. Yeah. You're gonna start with the Hindemith. Good. I'm glad this solo is it's asked on a lot of orchestral auditions. Um, it has this broad opening and it's it's really tough to actually put together with the piano part. So if you haven't actually worked on it, and, or if you are working on it, make sure that you put it together with the piano several months out, several weeks out um, before uh, the performance, just because that's a really tricky element. In general, length is good. Broadness is good with a, a solo like this. Um, just right off the bat, I kind of notice you have two noodle markings over all the C's, and those are the only markings you have, but to me, those are actually the only notes that you didn't play long. Well. Um, so when you play this again, really keep everything broad and long. We don't want to start too loud right? in this excerpt because we have a long way to go. Uh, it's just marked forte. Um, it's a lot of markings. We go to mezzo forte, I'll put mezzo forte minus, uh, just to give us room for a lot of variance and dynamic contrast. <laughs> That is, um, we can talk to Alex about that. But um, for this for this style, we, we need to have an open release. I meant that as a compliment. Um, <laughs> we need to have an open release on all of our quarter notes. Um, sounds like you're kind of cutting off either with your throat or the tongue, but we don't have open release. Does that make sense? Yep. Try here on the third bar. Yeah, quite half speed. Now watch your pitch on the G flat, it's a little low. That's much better. Um, one more time, same speed. Good, and then 
you keep the same style. There's no style change on the third bar. So you've had everything long, everything's broad, it's a nice opening. And then the third bar, just keep the same style and keep going. One more time from the beginning. Very good. Excellent opening. Now, you have a tendency when you take a breath, uh, you cut off the, the note. So. from the beginning, but we're doing the, the purpose of this, is that when you take your breath here, to keep the note long, to be able to take a breath and not lose any time. Okay. Just practice playing the E, and then taking a breath and finishing the phrase. Because we're taking a breath, nothing in the music should change. Everything stays the same, we're just taking a breath. Does that make sense? Yep. One more time. On the E natural. Just play that note one more time and then take a breath. Good. Now the trick is not losing any time, now that you've established. Okay. One more time. You did it again. You actually crescendoed a little bit before you took the breath. Same thing, you have the two notes to save us time. These notes are all long, crescendo. So we start a little softer. What's a 14 minus is actually what I would write in the part, just because it's just one dynamic marking. We want to make contrast. Um, okay. <laughs> Necessarily need to put a break there, but that's fine. Excellent. Next spot. So this is the same statement that we started the first piece, except what's the, that we started at the beginning of the piece. But what's the difference? That, but it's it's oh, fortissimo. Yeah, it's it's fortissimo. It's the second time around. It's more of a statement. It's like okay, now really. So uh, that just means broader, fuller, same concepts that we talked about before. And then keep these notes long just to save time. And then I put a little bit of more of a da da pronounced there. Let's see. Right here. And I, you 
have done a great job of putting these markings in your part, but like Tim, we have a tendency, all of us do, not just Tim, not just you, but myself included and everybody in this room, we have a tendency to underdo, we think we're, we're doing something, but we have to over-pronounce it to get the message delivered to our audience. So you have these crescendos written, and I sort of heard them, but if, if, you know, if someone had the part, you know, I really want... I want them to be able to have no markings and be able to just mark in exactly what's going on. Okay? Especially if you play this in an orchestral audition, time is so important in any idiom that you're playing. But rhythm, I mean, if you're playing, if you're auditioning to be part of an ensemble, rhythm is important so you can be part of the ensemble. So when you have, you know, when you go eighth notes to quarter notes or triplets to sixteenths, I mean, there's a lot of time, usually half speed of practice, to be able to know that you can establish that um, firmly on a consistent basis. One more time here. So we're doing this again, keeping... Keeping the eighth notes right in time. fast notes, you shorten up, and you end up, stop, you stop the notes with the tongue. So really, just try to, regardless of what the style is, what the technique is, you know, what we're working on, to keep everything uh, singing in full. Mm -hmm. Back 
up just a little bit here. Nothing like that. <clears throat> Yeah, still rushing the eighths. Here's D, two, Good, it's much better, except on this eighth you're playing more of a sixteenth or a triplet. tricky you know it's it's like everything is just everything's so slight as soon as you fix something else something else comes out of the window you know it's just it's a matter and that's why we have to record ourselves you should record pretty much everything you play i i pretty much record everything i play then i listen to it i never listen to the whole thing it's usually a measure or two and i have enough information of things that i want to improve that there's no reason to keep going just add to my laundry list so uh you know if i play something that's like 30 seconds or a minute sometimes i'll listen to 10 seconds of it and i'll stop it right away because the first note i would i wasn't happy with how i started it or you know it, it wasn't exactly what i think hendemith wanted so um record everything you play it doesn't you don't necessarily need to listen to all of it but you need to have that information available and going back and forth, that's what a, pra a great practice session, I think, is. It's recording yourself all the time, playing in short segments. Um, I'm going to tell a quick story. Augustine Hadelich, he is a, one of the world-famous violinists, soloists. He travels, plays in all the great orchestras. Um, he was my sweet mate at Juilliard, and I had the pleasure of waking up to him at 6 a.m. every day practicing. But when he would, would work on something... It was always half tempo, it was always little segments. Rarely did I hear him play through, you know, uh, an entire solo as he was preparing to go solo with an orchestra somewhere. It was always just little things and he had his recorder and he was always getting information going back and forth, working very slowly. Um, of course, I've, I've held the story and I've always been, uh, you know, I have so much respect for him. I mean, he came and soloed with the... Utah Symphony, I went backstage and I said hello, and he was like, oh, Mark! He gave me a hug, and he was like, you were the one who was always playing William Tell. Uh, and it was really loud at 7.30 a.m., so I, I decided to apologize, and I gave him a hug. Anyway, um, great job. In general, just a general comment. Um, record yourself all the time. That goes for everybody, including myself. Um, rhythm, not cutting off notes with the the tongue or with the throat um, and then just being very mindful as soon as you make a correction you have a tendency to let one of your already established habits sort of weaken a little bit so you know we have all these different levels that we have to work on playing and you want to make sure that you're mindful of all of them and as you're improving something else you don't want to ne neglect an area that you've already been working on so excellent job so it looks like Mahler 2 is Mahler Symphony 2, so you're going to start with the chorale, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, that's Mahler. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs>
before we go any further, balance, balance, balance. The two inner voices, actually, we could use more of. I hear you guys plenty. That's great. Keep the same. And I think you guys can come up. Or you guys could come down and you guys could say the same. But I feel like you're at a good volume for where we are. So maybe we'd play 5 to 10% more to fill out the chord. That is a very common... Um, Something I find in playing in an orchestra is that the middle voice actually um, is sort of the meat of the chord, and it really has to be present in order for everything to ring. A lot of people think maybe it's the first part, or but the, the first part is often heard because it's the highest voice. So to really have a balanced section, a lot of times it's the middle voices, believe it or not, that need to come out. And that, uh, that can affect the timbre and also when you're just uh, tuning a chord. You can actually, everybody can be playing in tune according to a tuner, and it can just be a volume discrepancy where one part of the chord needs to play a little bit fuller, a little bit softer, and then all of a sudden we have a ring in the chord. So um, just wanted to throw that out there. Let's start out one more time, second and third part, a little fuller. of bringing those out. You know, section playing is a lot of times we're, we're playing subdued and we have to know there might just be one note here and there that we have to bring out of the texture. And the more times we play it, the more times we get familiar with something, um, the better it is. I hope everyone noticed the difference in the balance mm -hmm. that we had that happened with just mm -hmm. the inner voices raising the end sound just a little bit. It was really very nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's keep moving forward just to get through the excerpt. Why don't we um, why don't we start in the let's see that's the tenth bar. Um, one, two, three, four. The tenth bar after ten. Let's go there, and then we'll keep going. Uh huh. And just before we start playing, let's go ahead and do a slight. Let's, I'll, I'll help you out, but before eleven, we're going to speed up just a little bit, like it does in the music. Interesting, um, for those of you, none of us have the music, but I can tell you the first part has uh, these, these carrots, uh, you know, on, on top of the, the half notes, and I believe all of the other parts, they have two dudos. Um, so, I think a lot of people play it the same, I like to make a little bit of a difference, but if you can have a little bit more um, uh, front, a little bit more, a little, just a little bit more... Christmas at the beginning of the note. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, it has nothing to do with volume. The volume is great. It's more of a stylistic thing. So before we go into the next section, let's get the corral happening one more time. Ian, make sure you don't come down too soft in volume. And also, um, I almost put a legato line. 
trying to open this to play really soon. Make sure you honor the, the carrots here. And Ian, when you have your moving quarter notes, just how you did bef uh, before, but, uh, just make sure that time you really kind of changed the volume, went back to the very first time, and just continue to fill in the section. It's very good. All right, again from the beginning. Balances. Let's take the. You know, this is a spot. This is a very special moment in the, in the symphony, and there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different tempos this can go. Um, I think it's going to a different tempo for me each time I've played it. So let's actually change it up on you, and let's go a little bit slower. Five bars before 11. As you got louder, you kind of got shorter with your notes. Let's do the opposite. As we get louder, let's get longer and broader with our notes. I know we have carrots. That might have been part of the confuse you. Keep the notes longer as we get louder and crescendo. Can we start five bars, pickups into five bars before 11? I'll count you off. One, two, three. <laughs> As you get louder, we have these two nudos, and we, we want to have more weight. I should have mentioned weight. Add more weight to the note on those four quarters as you're leading into 11. Make sense? One last time. Pick up into five before 11. One, two, three. <laughs> differently at 11, and that's probably maybe some of you have played it and some of you haven't, because there's a retard there. And um, so we'll do the retard, we'll do it one more time, and we'll retard. And that's kind of tricky, because two bars before 11, we have a forte piano, and then it stays soft, and then we crescendo to fortissimo, and then at the last minute we do a day crescendo into piano. So it's really tricky, depending on how fast the conductor takes it, to be able to get all of that in and honor the intentions of the, what the uh, Mahler wrote. Um, and if anybody doesn't know, Mahler, had, he's notoriously known for writing more instructions in your part than any other composer used to, where it's like, if you play something like Bruckner, there's nothing. So it's open for interpretation. But Mahler is very, very precise in his, um, in his instructions. So he gives us plenty of information to work with, uh, that's also more information that we need to honor. So let's do five before 11, and then a promise will, if, if everything goes well, we'll continue. So the five before 11 pickups. One, two, three. <laughs> as if it 
was like, we know this is the ending, but it needs to be special. We need to hold it to Nudo. Um, I think you held it the longest. We need to maybe just talk about that. Let's put it to Nudo over that uh, first quarter note, the downbeat of 11. Can we uh, start on the bar before, two beats before 11? One, two. <laughs> Trying to pick up, pick on you. It sounds fantastic. Just it's a balance thing. Um, very good, excellent. I wish we had the trumpet section here with us. That would be really wonderful. Um, yeah, that's a really great start. Uh, we've talked a lot about balance, keeping, being, uh, especially the inner voices, being mindful of kind of where you are in the section and being able to balance out the uh, outer voices. Does that make sense? Excellent. You guys sound great. Um, I think we still have some time. Is there Brahms? Is there another? We have Brahms one. Great. Oh. Okay. Okay. So you have Brahms one, and you guys have Brahms two. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> they do. They're just gonna. They, they feel comfortable. Okay. Whatever you decide. Whatever you decide. So go ahead. Excellent, nice start, beautiful. We just tune the first chord. Yeah. And you know, I usually start and we just tune the root in the fifth and then we add the third in the middle. Um, you sound just a little low actually. I feel yeah. like you can come up just a tad. And just in the interest of time, keep going this time. Again, again, balance. Um, can you tell me your name again? Michael. Michael. Yep. Great job. I think if there's any chance to play less, you can actually come up a little bit okay. and say the same. I think that'll fix the balance. Um.
the tricky thing is conductors, they like to hold this last chord forever. And so you want to make sure, like, a lot of times we try to make the whole thing in one breath or we breathe through early, and then you want to make sure that regardless, you know, and it can be different in the concert. I can't tell you how many times in rehearsals you do something one way, and then at the end, it's, you know, in the concert, it's, it's completely different. So you have to be... Especially in a Fermata note that's held soft and you're the only section playing. So it's, yeah. it's sort of fun. So flexibility is key. And that's sort of something I think that's come up that we've talked about in general a lot with balance. Um, you guys all sound great. Um, excellent job. It's just these, everything is in the details. And we've focused on a lot of details with a, a lot of folks today on different kind of elements of playing. But just seeing, making a list of all the different details that we need to be mindful of as musicians. And then you know, um, bringing all of those up and, and being awareness of, of what all those are. Today, for us in the section, mainly balance of knowing which voices. Sometimes we had the, the second and third voices come up a little bit. We had to come down just to kind of measure things out. And that can be difficult um, knowing just in the section. That's up to the conductor. But this goes back to the importance of recording yourself. If I had, like, another big message to just communicate... Um, something that has helped me so much is recording, recording, recording. And uh, it's not a process of recording a whole session and then going back and listening to the whole section. It's playing just a few bars at a time and maybe getting it right to where, in my mind, the, the, what I've created, if I, am I getting as close to that as possible? And then listening to that and seeing, okay, where actually, how far is the gap? between what I think I'm producing, what I want, what I'm striving for, and what, what do I need, where in my playing do I need to raise my standard? Where do I need to maybe explore uh, a higher level of imagine, imagination of what I'm, you know, creating? So, um, excellent job. Let's give them a hand.